So good afternoon, everyone. I'm indeed Wendy, Vice Principal uh, International. So no mid-afternoon slumps here. We're going to have a really exciting session, which has a particularly strong uh, international flavour. So I'm particularly delighted to introduce this session. We have, you will know the format now, three wonderful speakers who will speak for about 15 minutes each, and then we will have the opportunity for questions at the end. So our speakers are Shamima, Trish and Sanjay, and we're just about uh, to turn to them. The first speaker is Shamima Hack, who has been with us exactly 12 months. She joined in January 23 and she is a professor of accountancy. Uh, her doctoral studies and her early career were in Australia, in Melbourne and Brisbane respectively. So you must be feeling it's slightly cold here compared to an Australian summer. But her primary interest is in um, corporate social accounting, reporting, that whole incredibly topical area. So today she's going to talk to us about unethical working practices in the global supply chain. And I was thinking, am I wearing any fast fashion today? We may all get more guilty as the session goes on. But Shamima, we're delighted you've joined Dundee. We're delighted to hear from you. Over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Wendy Alexander, for the introduction and good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, the organizer, for inviting me today and also thank you all of you for being here. As uh, already Professor Alexander mentioned that my research area is in corporate social and environmental accountability. So my presentation today is also related to that, to the broader corporate social responsibility. I would be basically focusing on the unethical practices in the global supply chain. So my research area is Bangladesh um, and its ready-made garments industry, RMG sector, its clothing sector. Um, Bangladesh clothing industry, it is the second largest garments exporter globally, just after China and it is the most export earning sector for Bangladesh. So over 80% of its export earnings come from this sector, about 85% of its export earnings. Um, Four million people are directly employed by this sector, whereas over 40 million people are indirectly dependent on this sector. So you can understand the importance of this sector for its economy. It accounts for 20% of its GDP. And Bangladesh exposed to the countries like US, UK, European Union countries, Australia, Canada, and many more. Many global brands, retailers, they source product from Bangladeshi factories, including H&M, Marks & Spencer, Zara, Walmart, Gap, Primark, Adidas, Nike, and many more. <clears throat> Now, despite the importance of this sector, you would find that this sector has been under scrutiny for a long time. And um, this is because of the incidents, the catastrophe that has been happening in this sector over the years. It's not a one-off incident, but there has been many incidents like that. One such incident that we observed in back in nine, uh, 2013, the Rana Plaza collapse. It was an eight story building and there are five factories owners um, which employed 5,000 workers working at that time. And the factory, this factory, this building collapsed on 24th of April 2013, which killed about 1,200 workers and uh, um, another 2,500 workers were badly injured and some of many of them actually paralyzed for the rest of their life. So, and this incident, this uh, tragedy, basically arguably considered as the second largest industrial catastrophe in the corporate history, just after the Vopal gas tragedy in 1984. And, um, Aftermath of the collapse, when the journalists, the media, 
you know, NGO activist workers, when they managed to enter to the rubble, the ruins of Rana Plaza, the factory, they found that they found the labels and documentations linking to the major brands such as um, Primark, um, Matalan, Mango, you know, and many more. So it shows, you know, that this big brands and retailers who source product from this factory, from this supply chain, you know, but they do not really care that much about the working conditions and the health and safety conditions in this sector. Um, to give you some more information about the overall situation in the clothing industry in Bangladesh, the minimum wage it was 8,000 taka, which is equivalent to 65 pounds. Uh, recently, the workers have been protesting against it and they were asking for a better minimum wage, which is 22,000, uh, which is also only equivalent to 160 pounds. But they ultimately got only 12,500 taka, which is um, about 90 pounds, something like that. Uh, which came into effect in December 2023. So you can see that this sector is already vulnerable. The workers in this sector is already vulnerable. The exploitation is going on. Um, so we wanted to see in our research that what is the condition, especially during the COVID time. So um, we have done survey and interviews and we wanted to see our um, that how COVID, during the COVID time, you know, how the retailers practice, their purchasing practice or buying practice actually has an impact on the suppliers and the workers in the supply chain in the clothing industry. So we did a survey and uh, this project was funded by um, the Scottish Funding Council and interviews which was funded by HRC. Our research team complied of uh, the team from University of Aberdeen Business School and the School of Education. Um, and uh, also we had uh, um, the NGO collaborator transform trade with us. And we also had some local collaborators in Bangladesh who helped us with the data collection. So we surveyed 1000 suppliers. And it was carried out in December 2021 for the period that covers March 2020 to December 2021. Um, this sample represented 25% of all suppliers in Bangladesh that supplies goods to the global brands in the global south, in the global north. And then our interview um, took place with 37 key stakeholders, including representatives from NGOs, trade union bodies, UN and ILO representatives, and also 87 workers um, for the factories that sell product to the brands in the global north. So these interviews were carried out between November 2020 and July 2021. All right, so as I said that from our our uh, research, we wanted to know the buying or purchasing practices of the retailers, how these big brands, these retailers behavior or their pra uh, purchasing practices, how it was during COVID-19, how it has an impact on the suppliers and that lead to has an impact on the workers in turn. So what we have found from our survey is that <clears throat> there are some practices that has been identified as unfair by the suppliers. So for example, cancellation of orders, then the reduced price for the goods that have already been contracted. Uh, retailers refuse to pay for goods that has already been dispatched and uh, there are delayed payments for goods already been delivered. So these are some of the practices identified as unfair by our suppliers or the 1000 factories that we have surveyed. And um, the suppliers also reported that uh, 50, over 50% 50 of the suppliers reported that they were subject to one or more of these unfair practices. 
Um, the suppliers also uh, reported over 100 specific companies which actually was involved in three or more of these unfair practices. So what we have done afterwards, we um, out of this 100 and, uh, 104 companies that was involved in unfair practices, 27 of them were involved in three or more unfair practices. So we contacted those 27 brands or retailers and we emailed them. We let them know that this is what we have found and this is the um, unfair practices that has been identified by the suppliers. Only four of them came back to us with some responses, but the rest of them didn't really get back to us with any response. And the responses that we have got from the four brands, it was also very generic generic response that we have got. <clears throat> then uh, we want you to know because of these unfair practices by the buyers or retailers, how it actually impacted the suppliers or the factories uh, in Bangladesh clothing sector. What are the challenges they face because of these unfair practices? And what we have found is that the suppliers struggle to pay the minimum wage. Um, buyers reduce the price paid for the garment since March 2020. There was a reduction in demand from the brands and supplier, suppliers were selling at the same price in December 2021 as of March 2022, uh, 2020, and suppliers were selling below the cost of production in December 2021. So because of the unfair practices that we have observed here, it has an impact on the suppliers in turn. And then it actually had an impact on the workers because of the retailer's unfair practice, it has impact on the suppliers, which ultimately in turn has an impact on the workers' livelihood, their working condition. So for example, some of the direct impacts on workers in terms of job loss, over 25% of the um, workers lost their job um, during the period of analysis, low wages um, because suppliers didn't pay them even the minimum wage, unpaid overtime and not paid for work done, forced labor and exploitation because they are forced to do unpaid overtime and forced to meet unrealistic production target. And there was also increased verbal and sexual abuse. Some of the indirect impacts on workers, for example, included increased workers' financial burden to look after their family, poor living conditions in slums, health impact because of tiredness and depression, and there was no social security if unemployed. Now, over the years, we have seen that there are some regulations that actually came in place in different countries. Uh, the 2010 California Supply Chain Act in, in US, the UK Modern Slavery Act 2015, French Devoir Did Vigilant Act 2017, Netherlands, they have their um, Child Labor Due Diligence Act 2017, uh, Australian Modern Sl Slavery Act 2018, Germany recently introduced their, um, their Due Diligence Supply Chain Act 2023, European Union, they have their Due Diligence Act 2023. So, and there are other countries who are actually in the process of you know, um, are developing their own standard. The key question, however, remain that whether this regulation has really bringing any change in the supply chain practice, whether it has really an impact or not. And what we have found from our investigation that it is still not, there are a lot of things many more to do at this stage. The Modern Slavery Act still is not bringing any change. So we have actually um, disseminated our findings in different ways. Our findings has been published in some of the mainstream media like BBC, The Guardian and many more. 
we had uh, one session that we did in the was um, with um, the UK in the UK Parliament and also in the Scottish Parliament. The UK Parliament we did in 2022. Scottish Parliament we did this year 2023. We disseminated this information uh, in front of the MPs and. Uh, um, uh, um, MP Lease Trust back in 2022 in a private uh, bill. She re introduced a recommendation in the House of the Commons, which was accepted and still wait waiting a second reading on that. So we had some specific recommendations for the UK government, and the main recommendation that we have provided is that we need a garments trade adjudicator or fashion watchdog that will compile of the regulatory bodies, personal governing bodies, as well as, as well as the stakeholders who will oversee, monitor, enforce, and penalize the companies if there are any unethical practices going on in the supply chain. That was our specific recommendations for them. Um, we had a couple of reports that we have uh, published out of this um, with these specific recommendations. Um, you can have more information here. Thank you. The joys of the microphones. Thank you very, very much, Shamima. So now we come to the second of our three speakers, and this is the one that has a, a slightly more domestic focus. But I am delighted to uh, introduce momentarily Professor Trisha McCulloch. And uh, Trish is the Professor of Social Work here. Um, She's been with us some time, so I won't embarrass you about saying how long, but has a distinguished career both as a practitioner in the social work field and as an academic. And she is today going to talk to us about imagining what justice should look like in modern societies and our own part in securing it. So Trish, welcome and over to you. Thank you, Wendy. Good afternoon, folks. Nice to see you. OK, much of my research has focused on questions of justice and specifically what does justice look like for people who offend? It's motivated by my experience of a disconnect between expert and top down approaches to justice and the lived experience of people with convictions. Very briefly, Scotland has one of the highest imprisonment rates in Western Europe and reconviction rates post custody sit stubbornly at around 43%. Meanwhile, our prisons continue to be filled with people with significant experiences of multiple deprivation, trauma and loss, while providing little meaningful help with the problems that sit at the heart of their offending. In an attempt to bridge this disconnect, my research employs a participatory research me method, which essentially means involving and hearing from people with lived experience of the problem and challenges that we're trying to understand. There are good ethical reasons for a participatory method. Everyone has a right to participate in the social sphere, but it's also good social science. If we want to understand and achieve change in a social problem, and there are few as challenging as reoffending and reducing reoffending, we need to understand it from the experience of those who live it. So, what do we mean when we talk about justice? For most of us, justice is about fairness. It's about getting what we deserve. It's about equality and equity under the law. On a broader level, it's also about access to fair and equal opportunities to live a good life. But this is where justice starts to get complicated because life isn't fair or equal, and we don't all enjoy equal, ac equal access to opportunities.
my interest in these questions really began, I, I think, as a child. Um, I grew up in St Mary's, if you know the city of Dundee, I grew up in St Mary's, a housing scheme in the northwest of the city. And experiences of difference, of inequality and of poverty were every day. And I have quite vivid memories, unusually, of travelling on the bus. And this is this is one of the buses I would have travelled on as a child with my mum. And I remember observing on those journeys acute experiences of poverty and of inequality. And life seemed to me to, even then to be deeply unfair, with some people carrying more than their fair share of troubles. I also, however, experienced how human and community acts of love of kindness and of compassion could be transformative in that space. Moving forward, one of the key findings from my work is that if we want to advance justice for all, including people who offend, we need to understand the problem. As researchers, often we want to rush past the problem and onto the solutions. But understanding and sitting with the problem of offending and reoffending and the inequality that sits behind it is, is emerges as, as critical both to individual journeys of change and social journeys of change. Offending in Scotland is broadly understood as a problem of individual criminality. People offend, give or take, because they're bad or because they make bad choices. Justice systems operate on the basis that individuals are responsible for their behaviour. And if we get the punishment right, we will achieve deterrence and compliance with the law. The problem is our crime data tells a different story. Put simply, this theory and practice works for many of us in this room, but it doesn't work for everyone. And it specifically, it doesn't work for people who find themselves lost and locked into our justice systems. There's a long line of research studies, including my own, that make clear that offending is more than a problem of individual criminality. The messages on this slide speak to this, and I'm not going to, to take go through these one by one. I want instead to illustrate these messages through sharing one person's story, a story of their journey into and out of offending and all that goes with that. It's a typical story and I'm only going to share with you parts of it, but the words that I will be reading are the individual's words themselves. And it's, it's, it's a kind of narrative approach, very much reflects the kind of research that I do. And the invitation simply is to listen and understand. I've been institutionalized from quite an early age. I believe I was institutionalised. I was. From the age of 17 to 23, it was one prison sentence I was locked up on. You know, I hadn't even reached adolescence. Previous, there was a lot of care homes, early family breakdown. My mum had addiction issues. My old man had died when I was young. The social work department brought me up. I despised the social work department. There was only one gang I hated more than the police, and it was the social work. One of my earliest memories, maybe I was five or six year old, and my great granny stayed with my gran. I used to ask for money for the van and see if she didn't give me it. I used to boot her. That was me at five or six. Warning signals must have been there. My first arrest, was for stealing a bike. I can still remember it. My legs were too wee. They couldn't reach the ground. That was how I got caught. My legs couldn't reach the ground. That was age seven. That was me starting to get arrested. I could never understand it. It was as if dishonesty, manipulation, all that was built into me from a dead early age. Fast forward to many years later, I had been through the prison system and that environment. Something took place mentally and emotionally for me in the prison. It took me from the kind of drugs that made me sick to, I don't know, 
it's like the drugs started to become more what was going on for me. I think from a personal point of view, prison desensitizes you at a mental level, at an emotional level, and if you've got enough insight at a spiritual level. I remember arriving in Berlini. It was a cons jail. It was before the riots. It was sink or swim. You don't walk into that without feeling fear, apprehension, all these things. But you quickly learn that these are not feelings that you can allow yourself. They're not feelings you can show. You can see it in people and they make you vulnerable in that environment. So you quickly, and I had learned this from an early age through other, through children's homes and things, I'd learned from an early age to hide these things, these feelings. But you can only hold this stuff together so much before it starts spilling over. It's like coming through adolescence, coming through childhood, being nurtured, being protected. I don't believe I got any of these things. And then coming into a prison system, not just had I not had it, I really didn't want it by then. And so. I had a lot of romance, a lot of full committals. I had no ability to. I remember coming out, I was 23 and I had no ability to live a life. The biggest area, I had no ability to form relationships. I had a lot of resentment towards family members. I can only describe myself as a, emotionally as a ball of pain and of anger. I took a lot of drugs. I had no ability to deal with anything at an emotional level. I can remember coming out of jail. This was before I got the help that I needed. I had got out of Berlini and it was the usual scenario. You got out of Berlini in the morning. Somebody had phoned the drug dealer the night before and we were all just getting into taxis and going to his house. I remember getting out that morning and not doing that. And the funny thing was it was the shortest sentence I'd done. I was still in withdrawals. So for me to not go into that taxi and do the things I usually did, something was going on that I didn't understand. And I remember I was standing at a bus stop and it was freezing cold in the middle of winter. I was shivering and I was standing crying at that bus stop. And looking back, I wasn't crying. It wasn't emotional pain. I was crying because I knew I was going back to what I didn't want to go back to. But I didn't know anything different. I went back in. If returned to custody at that point and spent a further six years in and out of custody before he found his way into something good. If this is the problem, how do people who offend frame the solutions? This slide reports a more recent work with criminalised young adults in Ayrshire. We set out to understand what does justice mean and look like for you? We used a co-design method and a framework of real utopias, and we invited these young adults to imagine better than they'd known through their own experience. This is what we found. First of all, we found that they struggled to imagine beyond their lived experience. We have that in common. Repeatedly, they expressed, it's all on me. The only pe person that can help me is me. And there was a hugely internalised sense of responsibility and hopelessness. We pushed gently through that. And what we heard consistently was that justice and a good life involves three things. It involves a safe and secure home. Each of the young adults we worked with hadn't experienced a safe or secure home in their past or in their present. It involves belonging and inclusion within families, within communities and within society. 
It involves paths through life, fair and equal opportunities at key points of transition instead of the stigma and exclusion often experienced. And it involved personalised support, particularly at points of difficulty, rooted in understanding and empathy for the experience that they brought with them. I'm not sure how this sounds to you, but two things struck us about these findings. The first was how basic and underwhelming this utopian vision of justice was. And yet, how challenging this vision is to deliver for children, adults who experience offending, multiple, dis multiple deprivation and harm. The key takeaway from my work is that justice on these terms requires us to look beyond our existing models and systems. There are various frameworks that exist that can help us with this. Nancy Fraser argues that we generate justice by attending to cultural recognition, economic distribution and political representation. For Fraser, this can be distilled into parity of participation, encouraging and enabling participation in the social sphere. Axel Honneth argues that we need to address issues of recognition and misrecognition. And what he's talking about there is the stigma that follows social inequalities through a person's life, even when they manage to move out of some of the difficulties they experience. He argues that we do this through paying attention to love and belonging, so I connect with some of the things we've heard. Joan Tronto argues that we need to move beyond ideas and concepts of justice and to pay attention to values and practices of care and compassion. The problem is that these more expansive visions of justice haven't taken hold in our society, whether in our formal social systems or our informal social relationships. Instead, I suggest justice has become a very limited and limiting concept, constrained as it is by our frames of social separation and privilege. The image on the right is something I came across in Glasgow. It was on a billboard. You'll not be able to read the words, I'm sure, but it captures some of the messages that have that have come through and some of the ways forward. It says if we are more involved, then we will become more forgiving, more proactive, more grown up. So thank you, Trish. We come now to our third speaker, which is uh, Professor Sanji Singh. I had the pleasure of interviewing Sanji when he came to join us and we were just conferring. When was that? And uh, Sanji and his family arrived with us just about nine months ago. So he is the newest of our uh, joiners for this panel. Um, he works here in Dundee, but also serves as the editor uh, in chief for the Journal of Asian Business Studies. I think that's fantastic that it's it's edited here from uh, here from Dundee. And his research interests are in the whole field of human resource management. He is a chair also in our School of Business of Human Resource Management and has a particular research interest in how talent can support innovation and sustainability. And so today he's going to talk to us about the great resignation, that phenomenon where people decide they've had enough of the world of work. So can I invite you to welcome Sanji? Sanji, over to you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the invitation and thank you so much for introducing me. So uh, I will be talking to you on the topic which is of interest to us here and to the world beyond this room, uh, which is the great resignation that we've been part of uh, since COVID-19. So we'll take you through what are the main causes and consequences of the great resignation. Great resignation is basically en masse turnover employee turnover, employee leaving voluntarily their jobs. So I will take you through 
uh, and these are the uh, key pointers okay that my presentation will be on uh, it will be on what the great resignation is what it what it is and what are the causes impact and consequences of great resignation uh, great resignation okay uh, is basically the word okay was coined during 2019 covid 2019 uh, it's basically associated with great famine okay that the world witnessed so this great resignation that the people were leaving organization for several reasons those reasons could be personal social or organizational in nature and this trend uh, has been all across the globe whether it is north america europe asia or oceana so but we do not know uh, for sure at this point of time yes there has been research going on some publications but still uh, more to uncover the causes and consequences of great resignation uh, this great resignation resignation okay if you look into the literature if you come across okay we've been talking about the big quit and the big quit is basically uh, associated okay kind of uh, uh, this terminology coined because of big data so that we can really okay associate with or great resuffle uh, the second thing is that uh, it's not just the blue collar jobs or the white collar jobs or the low paid or high paid jobs so jobs across the continuum that the people been working during the covid and after okay that people started leaving the job voluntarily uh, we have okay a literature which says that uh, in us okay around 41 47 million workers okay they left the job they quit the job okay uh, and so was the trends okay in asia as well as in europe uh, this great resignation okay uh, so when uh, we looked into uh, the industry we got to see that yes great resignation affected uh, several industries across industries but uh, the most affected of them okay were technology healthcare industries and meat carrier employees uh, when we looked into the data here in uk okay we found that uh, there is high percentage of employee in the uk healthcare sector okay they are quitting en masse so it's not just the number of employees but also the quality of employees the talent that there has been a talent leakage okay uh, in the uk health industry which uk health sector does not want but it's been happening so uh, having said that uh, uh, if we look into okay all these things that i just shared with you it's just like a kind of general strike so when you have a kind of general strike the word on your uh, screen okay so many things come up so could be because of the workload could be because of some kind of dissatisfaction with the pay or flexibility lack of flexibility at workplace or burnout or so many stress related factors which has led to this great resignation which is more akin to general strike that the world has witnessed uh, so this is one part and the second part is that uh, this uh, there has been a cost associated with the great resignation the cost could be at an employee level the cost could be at the department level or at an organization or industry level so it's basically okay a kind of lose lose situation rather than win lose situation okay for employee and the employer so as a result of that uh, so there are three themes okay that the people those the researcher and the practitioners been working in the area of late for last couple of years because this great resignation is a new phenomena it is here to stay uh, but it will be manifested in different form than the form that we had during the covid-19 situation yes the literature also says that we are also 
having okay a kind of phenomena called great regret what is the great regret is that during the great resignation it was a kind of peer pressure it was a kind of social pressure that my friend left why not i should be leaving okay my job citing these these reasons but once they came off okay and they are not getting jobs so it's a kind of guilt a kind of regret that is also being experienced okay by the employee who left during the great resignation era so these are the three themes that uh, i thought i should okay uh, speak on the first one is about what are the drivers of great resignation the second one is the impact of the great resignation and third one is the uh, the strategy that the organization can have to arrest great resignation or convert great resignation into great retention era uh, for the employee so looking into theme 1 which is about the driver or the causes of great resignation uh, so what i found that there can be a three set of factors the first is associated with the matrix the hr matrix may be associated with the compensation and incentives or the time between two promotions that the employee had the employee uh, employees were expecting promotions but organization or the boss okay was not going for that or could be a kind of leadership style uh, that these days we are talking about diversity equity inclusion most of the employees they are interested in having a kind of inclusive leadership maybe from the team lead to the department lead to the organization lead uh the second factor is about the changing nature of the working conditions so it's not just a 9 to 5 job coming to the office employee wants okay a different format of the working conditions uh, like remote working or hybrid working or flexible work so it's not that you should come at 9 o'clock or 8:30 and leave by 5 or 5:30 the third factor uh, that uh, we looked into okay uh, was the demographic factors so this great resignation okay if somebody looks into the data set of the employee leaving the organization so can be categorized on the parameter age or gender or education or class for example generation g, g and y as compared to baby boomers okay they have a different uh, behavioral response when the things happening during the covid 19 situation and currently so these are the three set of factors uh, into theme one which is the driver of great resignation the second one is that if that are the drivers uh, which affect employee to think and leave organization so what could be the impact of that great resignation so the impact could be at several level it could be at an employee level when i was talking to you that because of some pressure social pressure or pressure from peer group uh, many of the workers employees they left and they found later on that they should not have some of them certain percentage and they are under a kind of guilt or regret so that's the great regret so imp so impact are on employee level impact is also on the organization level because when your employee is leaving hiring an employee uh, and retaining the employee is the most critical thing uh, so if you if if the talent is leaving if your organization is bleeding out talent so the talent takes away the knowledge that was co created at workplace and when you hire somebody it takes at least one full cycle one full academic year or one full financial year to have him functioning or have her functioning at 100% level uh, the statistic says that for first 6 months the employee that whom you have hired okay they work 50% less than what he or she is being paid but when they complete one full cycle then they start giving organization back what the organization has been paying in terms of salary and compensation uh 
the third impact is on HR and the future of work. What it says that the life that we had before COVID-19, okay, it will not come again. So the life that we will be having in the organization, okay, moving forward, okay, it will be leveraging technology. It will be the different working conditions thus that will have an impact on human resource when they recruit and select employees when they go for training and having them stay retention strategy the compensation strategy and so on and so forth and finally the impacts on blue collar and white collar workers okay will be different so it's not just what it was before covid 19 okay that since the world is now coming back to the normal, the organization can have the same kind of practices and policies vis a -vis blue collar and, and white collar workers. Finally, the third one is the organizational uh, theme one, which is how to contain. It says that we should have a different kind of focus on employee-employer relations. Gone are the days when organization was dictating the terms. We are in a different world. Hence, we should listen to the people. We should have them part of the process while formulating the policies and practices that will be laid out in future for the manager and the employee to practice. The second one is about strengthening the recruitment and retention strategy. See, the retention of the employee, the retention of the talent is dependent upon the recruitment that we did in the first stage because recruitment okay, has a kind of close linkage between okay, uh, the retention one. If you have not found a right person for the right job, then having them stay in the organization will be a difficult time, especially moving okay, uh, into the world which is a technology oriented okay nature of the work the third one is the role of leaders and hrm departments a leader has to have we say that we have diversity equity and inclusion it should not be just on the wall it should be experienced by the employee for example when we conduct a meeting the leader should not just come and speak out. Leaders should be there and have the people speak out. Thus, this way, the people feel that they are being included into the scheme of things and the leader is listening to them. This way, the leader can also have some innovative ideas coming from the people and that innovative ideas can be implemented or can be uh, can, can have an influence on the policies and practices. So inclusion or inclusive leadership. And the last one is the, is the gig economy a viable option? Means that should we go for a contractual job or should we go for okay, a non-permanent job? The organization will have to think okay, in a different way, depending upon the nature of the business that the organization is in. The last but not the least, the organization should put employees front and center. If we, if, we, if we have employees on the front and the center, the policies that will be formulated will be pro-employee. The reason is that organization exists to cater to the needs of the society and to cater to the needs of the society, organization needs people. Whether the organization is an education industry, from education industry or from fashion industry, we need people. It's not just machine and technology, it's the people. So putting people front and center, okay, is the key going forward. Uh, and that's all from my side. Thank you.
better this time. So thank you to our three speakers and can I invite you to join us? So Shamima, Trish, Sanji, come and join us. And I now turn to our audience for uh, questions on three extraordinarily interesting talks. Excellent. I will come to the lady in the centre. If we got the microphone, fantastic. Thank you. Have thank a great seat. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you to all our three speakers for the really fascinating presentations. I learned so much. Thank you for that. I teach American, contemporary American literature here at the university. And listening to your thought, there's at least one novel that I have taught that deals with the issues that you're describing. And I guess that got me thinking, could maybe all of three of you tell us a little bit more about how interdisciplinarity might play a role in your research? Thank you. Oh, I think we're going to do it in reverse order. Sanji, you've been on the stage, we're keeping you. So interdisciplinarity, how does it uh, influence the issues you've been dwelling on today? Uh, see, going forward, uh, I can answer this Okay, uh, as a researcher, as an editor. So I work at several journals uh, as editor. So interdisciplinarity okay, is the future going forward. It's happening. As a researcher, I do interdisciplinary research at the intersection of HRM, knowledge, innovation for sustainable performance. Uh, yes, OK, uh, the presentation that I was, uh, we were having of Samima and Tris, I can see, OK, that we all were talking about the justice, justice in a different form. So, so we can really explore and understand and expand and advance the discipline of justice, okay, if we have interdisciplinarity, okay, as a lens put together. So that's the future and we are working. Uh, uh, and if we have good re research, okay, uh, from interdisciplinary perspective, there is high probability of that research, okay, going forward, okay, uh, in the journal, okay, getting published after some reviews and revisions. Yeah. Mm, fascinating, the lens of justice. Samima, over to, to you. Thoughts on interdisciplinarity. Thank you. Um, I agree completely with Sanjay. I think the presentations all of us have done today, it all has part of interdisciplinary in it. Uh, personally, my research area, as I say, that is in uh, CSR, social environmental accountability, uh, sustainability. So it has interdisciplinary in it as a theme. Um, it's not just business school, but the other schools. If you look at uh, the social perspective or the environmental perspective, issues like climate change, all has you know interdisciplinary in it and there are lots of scope that we can do together we can work together in a collaborative way to bring some really meaningful change and um, solution in this area so yes completely agree with Sanjay and me. Trish? I think probably one of the key messages I was bringing is that we will not advance justice at a social level and an individual level through technical solutions. So it's not simply about kind of experts understanding the problem and proposing a solution. It's really about how we as a society take these things forward. And my understanding of these issues has been greatly influenced by literature. Um, uh, Young Mungo, a very recent kind of fictional text by Douglas Stewart, gets absolutely to the heart of everything I spoke about there. So for me, these kinds of stories allow us to engage with these ideas, um, sometimes more meaningfully than research statistics too. So I think we need to use the different medias to help us understand and help us change. Thank you. I was thinking you started with um, one of your prescriptions, the end was a safe and secure home. And in one sense, it's such a simple, simple idea of a safe and secure home, but the kind of interdisciplinarity of what it takes to build or create that is extraordinary. So other colleagues, questions? Uh, yes, can I take the gentleman at, at, at the back? Hi, thanks. I've got a question just for Trish to which I hope the answer is no. <laughs> um, do you think um, the Scottish government's aspiration to ensure that all children are brought up to feel loved and cared for is an unattainable utopia? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, 
No, I mean, if, if we had more time, I, I might have spoken about the promise and, and some of the recent Scottish Government work around the promise and around centering love um, and children's need to be loved. And it's actually it's absolutely what we heard. You know, I was working a re reference work with young adults there. You know, they weren't 17, they were 23 and 24. And, um, and that sense of not having worth because not having an immediate and obvious sense of having been loved was absolutely critical to their experience. So I, I think, you know, I was listening, there was a Radio 4 programme on The Promise quite recently, and I was listening and I really applaud Nicola Sturgeon's ambition and tenacity through that. But the challenge is how do we, you know, politician can't deliver that. We deliver that in our communities, in our relationships. So I, I think it is um, achievable. I think we have to believe it's achieve achievable, but it's on us. I'm going to follow the question's example and push Trish a little harder because as some of you will know that this was the promise that, you know, every child will look to have a safe home. Quite a lot of the commentary in the press in the very recent past has been, it's all the fault of the professional social workers. They didn't want to make it happen. So give us a couple of sentences on why has it been so hard to make progress, given the commitment and the aspiration. For, for those of us who are ignorant, Sure, in lightness. Yeah, yeah. This is a conversation I have read because of course I have friends who are teachers, social workers. I, th I think one of the most significant challenges is there, there, there are many instances, and the F story was one of them, where the home environment is not a positive, nurturing, safe or secure environment. Um, and sometimes you're not able in the short term to make that safe and secure. So what we do then is we often remove the child from the home and we place them in another home and we want that to fix it. But it doesn't always fix it. Sometimes it does. Great. We've got we've got a journey that's positive and 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 good. And, and we don't hear about those stories. But the problem is you can provide the physical safety. But not the interior sense of I'm OK. Um, so that's why it's so difficult. And, and my view, and it's far too simplistic to say, sometimes in those situations, the social worker can't get it right because they're taking you from the family, which is maybe the only place you feel that you belong. And they're putting you somewhere where you may not ever feel that you belong. And of course, there are positive accounts there. But so I, I, I think why in the press is it's all the social workers fault? Because they will be the ones key to those decisions of removing children. And if you talk to children who have been removed, F had a huge amount of resentment towards his family. He did not grow up in a, a safe place, but he still resents the social workers for removing him because it, it's party to all sorts of trauma. OK, you can you can grab Trish after because I fear I'll, I'll derail it. Any other questions? I'm going to take one here and then come to one of the questions online. The lady at the back. Thank you. Thank you to each of the speakers for um, some really fascinating stories and insights into your research. I want to, I wonder, it may be an unfair question to each of you. What's the one thing that you would like to see that you think could improve justice and equity in your respective domains, whether that's suppliers and manufacturers, political and social justice or employment? Shamima, let's start with with you. What's the one thing that moves us forward? Because you did also share, but answer the question, and then we'll 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 go around it. But what would what's the one thing? I think one word for me: accountability. We all need to be accountable in terms of what we do. It's the same thing for the retailers, same thing for the suppliers, same thing for the regulators, and and also for researchers. Everyone, we we have to be accountable in terms of to doing the right thing. So in terms of my research, I can just simply, you know, re-emphasize that it's the accountability of the retailers. It's their duty to do the right thing and as um, for the regulators as well. Thank you. OK, we're going to take this in the order that the colleagues spoke, so Trish, you. Probably to use uh, one of the answers the young adults gave. They said, it's all on me. That was how they understood. And, and 
there's I suppose what I'm going to do is agree and disagree. I don't think it is all on that individual, but I do think it's on all of us. So I think for me, generating justice, advancing justice, it's not something for them to do. It's not something for politicians or professionals. It's on all of us in our individual relationships and in our contribution to the social sphere. And we actually need to co-own that responsibility. Big task for for the new year. Right, Sanjay, over to you. Uh, for me, uh, I would say that uh, we should have inclusive leadership, not as a trait to be there in a person who is a leader, but should be practiced as being experienced by the fellow colleagues. And when we have inclusive leadership in place, the leader listens to. And when the leader listens to, the employee feels that, OK, he or she is being OK, uh, part of the scheme of things Okay, that is there in the department. And if there is inclusive leadership, whatever we have here, for example, at University of Dundee, diversity, equity and inclusion, that can be really practiced practice in a real sense of the term rather than there in the uh, book okay of those chapters of diversity equity and inclusion so inclusive leadership practice okay not theory is must thank you so now i'm going to come to one of the questions online and it's quite complicated so it's on me to try and articulate this, and it's to sanji and we're back to the great resignation are people sharing their views on institutional loyalty more often? That's part one. Part two, employees are simply reacting to the deficit that employers have shown in their embrace of the neoliberal post-war settlement. So employees are giving back what they see from employers. And finally, is this particularly true of Gen Z, younger people, who have less experience of employers being loyal to them. OK, thank you. So uh, it's both sides. OK, I would not OK. My own reading of the literature is not just from the employer side, the deficit in the employer side or the employee side. OK, it is in the both side, but OK, there is a kind of uh, understanding, OK, uh, understanding is the problem Okay, from employees side of the employers, the limitations of the employer, right? And at the same time, employer, OK, uh, has a problem to understand the expectations, OK, of the employee. Uh, going to uh, the different generation, OK, uh, it's not just generation G, but OK, it's it, it's there, but generation G in more uh, the percentage is high as compared to other generation. So going forward, going forward, OK, we need to have again, OK, a, a kind of view okay, in the organization. I will come back to the inclusive leadership uh, that if we include the people. People will think that the organization okay, is thinking about me, listening to me, OK? Maybe not, but have this practice in place. The great resignation, the talent leakage, okay, can be okay uh, uh, reduced significantly. Thank you. Big challenge for the leadership team and the court members, inclusive leadership to us all. But dangerous territory. We're moving towards a close close for today. Are there any final questions? Yes, Sean, one of our earlier participants, certainly is the right to ask a question. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is for Shamima. So uh, I wonder what's the perspectives from the retailers, you know, like the H&M. So I mean, I assume it's about the cutting cost, but the cutting cost itself is not an uh, issue, right? So uh, what uh, are there something missing? What are their perspectives in this, uh, what you call is unethical practice? So, um, sorry, just to repeat your question. That, yes, so, so oh, yeah. what are the perspectives from the retailers, the, the, those, retailers. You know, the uh, yeah. buyers of those clothes, right? Yeah. So, well, why they don't do more ethical? Why they pay? You know, Great so, question. Why did they, you know, why did Primark and, and Evidence behave so badly and yeah. do this after all these people had yeah. died? Yeah. I have the same question. Yeah. I think that's. Um, 
So from the findings are uh, our research, what again that it's the profit motive that actually were working here. Why they go to the global south in the first place for sourcing their product for their production for their supply chain? Why they are going there? Cost cutting, cheap labor there. So this profit motive is definitely working here, which is actually impacting. And we have seen that during COVID-19, it is even intensified. And that has an impact on the suppliers, which in turn impacted uh, you know, the workers. So the whole you know, point of the research and the recommendation is that, you know, th that these retailers need to be more accountable and moving away from this core profit motive, motive perspe perspective. That was the that was the expectations from them. Now, whether they will be doing it or not, that's a different story. And that's why we ask that the regulators, they should come in place, they should come forward with more stringent regulation act bill in this regard. Thank you. Great note to finish on. Can I just say a word of in the housekeeping space? We are about to finish um, in these austere times. There are no drinks today. There will be if you last until Friday, uh, but we're about to conclude. But a very, very warm welcome to everybody to come back tomorrow of another day in the same vein. Um, there is kind of coffee and croissant from uh, nine o'clock tomorrow and we start at 9.30. So can I bring today's proceedings, the first day of Discovery Days, to a close and invite you to put your hands together and thank uh, our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.